Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for the first webinar of Yahad Be Yeshua in this new year. Yahad Be Yeshua is an international ecumenical fellowship of Jewish disciples of Jesus who participate in diverse synagogue and church communities. We're happy to have you here with us for our third episode of the public webinar series. And for the first time, we are offering live translation into Russian. And so you can select the interpretation icon in the bottom right, should you wish to listen in. I'm one of your hosts, Amanda Actman, and our topic today explores the life and legacy of Cardinal Aaron Jean-Marie Lustiger, also known and remembered as the former Archbishop of Paris and as the Jewish Cardinal. In his honor, we're going to begin today's webinar with a prayer that he wrote. My Lord, here again are some hours of my life that have passed. Another day, you know how it was. I myself do not know it well, but I ask you to enlighten it with your light. I want to turn to you. I want to try to understand your will. I want to recall what you expected from me and find my true freedom, daring to say to myself and to you, today you called me, today you told me to do your will. Did I pay attention to you? Lord, forgive me. I spent this day without paying attention and don't remember anything. Give me the strength to remember so that days would not pass like water, and would not go away like smoke. Allow me to live fully, Lord, for you give me life. Allow me to live to love you, that my feelings would not be as fleeting as clouds or ashes that are the toy of winds, that my life would not pass fleetingly, consumed in vain for nothing, but that it would be inscribed day after day in the eternity of your love. Amen. All right, with that, I would like to turn it over to my co-host, Jason, who will introduce our speakers. Well, hello, everyone, and Happy New Year. We're uh, glad that you're here. Uh, like Amanda said, I'm Jason Moreff, and I'm pleased to introduce our guests and our topic um, today. Uh, Aman I must say that uh, I don't know much about Cardinal Luce today, but Amanda's excitement for this topic has gotten me very jazzed for our topic today and our speakers. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Father Etienne Viteau, who will share about Cardinal Luce today, whom he actually knew as a family friend. Um, Father Etienne is a Roman Catholic priest of the Shimon Nuif community. He is also professor, professor of theology at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, where he serves as the director of the Cardinal Bia Center for Judaic Studies. Uh, the webinar will also feature a journey story from Dr. Matthew Friedman, who is program director and professor of intercultural studies at Kingswood University. And Dr. Friedman will share his faith journey with us today as a Jewish follower of Jesus. Now, at the end of the webinar, uh, as usual, there will be some brief updates and announcements from Rabbi Dr. Mark Kinzer. And as always, after the interview and story, we'll have time for questions. So as they arise during, um, during our speakers, feel free to type them in the chat or just as they arise in your mind. Now, today we'll actually wrap up a few minutes before noon so people can leave in time if they desire to watch the inauguration events if they so, if they so choose. Um, as always, uh, yeah, like I said, write questions as they come and are at the end in their Q&A, the hosts will, con will consolidate our questions and ask them on your behalf. So without further ado, let us welcome Father Etienne. Um, hello, Amanda. Hello, Jason. Hello, everyone. Um, it's nice to be with you. Uh, so to speak about the life and person of Aaron Jean-Marie Lustiger, as I was asked to, um, I will concentrate on three aspects. His life and faith story will be the, um, the first one. Uh, then what it meant for him to be a Jewish, both Jewish and a Catholic. And uh, then the impact he had on the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, I, he's written a lot. There's a, a great movie that was um, made on him, which is called The Jewish Cardinal. And I've taken the movie's title for my presentation. Uh, but so I will use these references, these resources, but I also happen, he also happened to be a personal friend of our family. And so I will intertwine this presentation with some uh, aspects of the, what I remember from knowing him as a, as a child and as a young man. 
Let's start with the, the life and faith story. Lustiger was born uh, Aaron Lustiger in Paris in 1926 to a Jewish family. His parents were from Poland. They had left the country around World War I. They were not very observant Jews, uh, but they were very clear about their Jewish identity. And uh, Lustiger, for example, was insulted and beaten up at school. His parents had to wear the yellow badge during the war. His mother was deported to Auschwitz, Birkenau, where she was killed uh, in 1942, 1943. Now, what happened is Lustiger, when he was 10 years old, one night stole the key to his per parents' reserved bookshelf. And what did he find in this reserved bookshelf? One of the books was a Protestant Bible, so with an Old and a New Testament, which he read from A to Z. It made a profound impression on him. And uh, um, he said that the, he had the impression that the Old Testament flowed into the New Testament. He was 10 years old. Afterwards, he met um, uh, in Germany some, his first Christian adults, and he was in a family that was uh, against the Nazi regime. Uh, and um, he also had a personal experience with illness, which means that he was led when he was almost 14 years old, just a few a month before his 14th birthday, to ask for baptism uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, taking the name of Aaron Jean-Marie. Uh, he was then ordained a priest when he, in 1954 at the age of 28, and he held different positions in Paris as a university chaplain, uh, a parish priest. So here you have uh, a photo of Lustiger with his family when he was uh, there. He's um, 1933, so seven years old. And then uh, as a young man uh, in, uh, four, well, 14 years old, uh, that's just when he was baptized in 1940. He's the second to the left. Uh, He's ordained priest in 1954. He, he then becomes Bishop of Orléans in 1979 and Archbishop of Paris in 1981. And John Paul II creates him Cardinal in 1983. That's, it's in those years that um, when he was a university chaplain that my parents met him. My father, Miklos Vette, uh, was a Hungarian Jew who had lost most of his family in the Shoah but had been saved as a child by Catholic nuns. He was adopted by a Jewish family, but then when he was 18, he um, discovered Jesus as a savior. He an entered the Roman Catholic Church. He also fled Hungary. And when he arrived in Paris, what did he do? He went to the chaplaincy, of course, of the Sorbonne and met a beautiful French woman who became his wife and my mother. And he also met a young dynamic chaplain who had a, practically the same life story as he had, Jean-Marie Lustiger. They became very close friends. And I remember at home, uh, he came very often. I think he was the first Catholic priest I, I met as a child. And um, in the evening, I would see him hunched together with my father discussing about the world, about the church, about so many things. Uh, I also think that I, I learned quite a few. He, he, he was very free in his speech. And unfortunately, I learned my first swear words also from, from Lustiger. Here you have on the left Lustiger as a bishop. Uh, and this is a, a photo I found in, in my, on my father's desk. Uh, you can't see it very well because uh, it's, it's really old. But on the left, you see Lustiger and my father on the right hand. This was during a trip to Hungary that my father had org organized for, for Lustiger. Lustiger considered, this is the second point, that he was both Jewish and Catholic. Um, when he became a bishop, many, a, a lot of the church authorities and many journalists would say, oh, we have a, a, an, a Catholic bishop who has Jewish roots, who has Jewish origin. And Lustiger would be adamant about the fact that he not only had Jewish roots, but he was still Jewish. In becoming a Christian, he said, I did not intend to cease being the Jew I was then. I was not running away from the Jewish condition. I have it from my parents. I can never lose it. I have it from God. He will never let me lose it. And he would even say about the fact he was named bishop that my nomination as a bishop meant for me that all of a sudden it was though the crucifix were wearing a yellow star. 
He insisted on that with me too. I remember once I, I thanked him uh, because he had really pushed my father to go visit the concentration camp where my mother had been, where his, grand, his mother, my grandmother uh, had been murdered. Um, and um, I thank Lu Jing. thank you for having pushed my father. It's important for him, those are his roots. And Lustiger looked at me, he pointed his finger almost, you know, it, touching my nose and said, Etienne, those are your roots. You need to rediscover them. And he, he really insisted on that every time I met him. This was true non with, notwithstanding tensions. Um, on the Christian side, his nomination as a bishop was attacked by the Lefebvreans. I'm quoting, they said it was a profanation of the church to have named a Jewish bishop and then a Jewish cardinal. And he also had quite a few tensions on the Jewish side. Former chief rabbi of Israel, Ashkenazi chief rabbi of Israel, uh, Yisrael uh, Meir Lau, publicly said, we are talking about someone who betrayed his people and his faith during the most difficult and darkest periods in 1940. And he compared Rustige's attitude, uh, saying, well, he said it was a form of extermination because if people continue doing this, there would be no one left to recite the Kaddish. There would be no people of Israel left. Of course, Rustige knew that his choice of Jesus and of the Roman Catholic Church made him a special kind of Jew. I am discovering another way of being a Jew, he said. And he would even say, I am discovering a better way of being Jewish. According to what I knew, I had discovered a better way of being Jewish, according to what I knew then of Judaism. So what did this mean for him? He, he said that it was recognized Jesus as the Messiah, that Judaism found its meaning for him. I tried to gather some, some of his reflections on this, and I think that what he meant was that um, he understood uh, the values of Judaism. This is a quote from Lucie G. He understood the values of Judaism uh, through Jesus, because Jesus epitomized them, and Jesus made it possible to, to live them. What are these values? Monotheism, but what that means God has created us through love and asks us to love in return. And, and he would say, basically, what Judaism has to bring to mankind are these values and the Messiah, Jesus, who shows what it means to completely live out these values and makes it possible to live them out. Now, Lustiger had a profound impact on the, um, the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church. Um, maybe this will be my, my third point. Uh, just maybe I will insist on two aspects. The first one is that he was keenly aware of the loss of the Judeo-Christian part of the church, the, what he called the Ecclesia ex circumcisione. Um, and for him, uh, one of his reasons of, of existence was to bring back this dimension of the church. He would say Catholic, the Greek Catholon, according to the fullness, what it really means is the bringing together of na the nations and of, uh, the, um, of, of the Jewish people and of the nations. And he believed that this was happening, for example, in what he called the Church of Jerusalem, the Kehillah in Israel. Uh, we have here a, a photo of Lustiger as a young priest celebrating in front of the, the Lake of Galilee. Another very important dimension was his relation with John Paul II, the Pope, who became a real friend. Um, so he, John Paul II is the one who uh, uh, named him as a bishop. And I remember that in, in 1999, I was working in a Vatican commission uh, and with Pope John Paul II and other people, and all of a sudden, Lustiger barged in, and, and the Pope just stopped speaking with us. He went off with Lustiger, and they spent 20 minutes huddled together uh, speaking. And I, I, I knew that th when they spoke, they did not only solve practical questions for the church, but they, they were trying to, they were speaking about philosophy, about theology, about the meaning of society, the meaning of Christ, the meaning of Jesus. And there, it's, it's pretty clear that 
uh, Luce Tiger help John Paul II understand how important this dimension of Judaism uh, was. John Paul II is probably the Pope who brought the church forward the most, the Roman Catholic church forward the most after Nostra Aetate. For example, he's the one who declared in 1980 that the old covenant uh, was not revoked. Since this was in 1980, I'm not sure that Lustiger had a great influence on this point because John Paul II had many Jewish friends before. He went to Shabbat dinners when he was bishop in Poland. Uh, but probably a lot of the events that happened afterwards, maybe already this one, but a lot of the events that happened afterwards, a lot of the step forwards he took um, were made through the influence and in the discussion with uh, Luce Tiger. For example, uh, the first visit of a pope since the antiquity to the synagogue of Rome in 1986, or John, Paul's, John Paul II's decision to push uh, the Roman Catholic bishops of Poland to ask Carmelite nuns who had set up a monastery in Auschwitz to leave in 1993, or again, John Paul II's prayer at the Western Wall uh, and his declaration of repentance in 2000 for the sins of Catholics towards the Jewish people. I'm going to conclude this presentation, skip a few slides, uh, and conclude this presentation with uh, Lustiger's epitaph that he wrote himself, which is in the Cathedral Notre Dame of Paris. It was, I was at his funeral. It was very impressive because he had organized that his cousin, Arnaud Lustiger from Israel, recite the Kaddish outside of the church. We were all outside of the cathedral. And then we entered and there was a Roman Catholic funeral. And here is the epitaph, which is still now on a pillar in Notre, Notre Dame of Paris. I was born Jewish. I received the name of my paternal grandfather, Aaron. Having become Christian by faith in baptism, I have remained Jewish, as did the apostles. I have, as my patron saints, Aaron the high priest, Saint John the apostle, Holy Mary full of grace. Named 139th Archbishop of Paris by His Holiness Pope John Paul II, I was enthroned in this cathedral on 27 February 1981, and here I exercised my entire ministry. Passers-by, pray for me. Aaron Jean-Marie Lustiger, Archbishop of Paris. Thank you, Father Etienne. Uh, and uh, my wheels are spinning after um, what you've shared. I was wondering if you might elaborate a bit about how Cardinal Lustiger thought about his own Jewish identity and expression. That is, you know, what his Jewishness meant. Um, and I'm particularly curious how he navigated or if there were any tensions he saw between his Jewishness, Jewishness and his identity as a Catholic. Um, yes, I, uh, you were, you're right. I probably didn't, could have said more about this. Um, it's true that um, uh, probably one of the questions here is, is his relation to the law, to the Mosaic law. <laughs> Jew, uh, Le Sujet himself uh, used to say that he was not a good Jew according to the practice of the law. Um, uh, he also said that he never claimed to be a good Christian either. <laughs> he tried to do his best. And um, I remember that it was a big question for, for example, Michael Vishegrad, who is a, a pretty well-known Jewish thinker, who was also a friend of our family. And my, my father introduced him to Lustiger. And Vishegrad had this insistence that a Jew, even if he became a Christian, and this was my father's case and, my, and Lustiger's case, would need to continue observing the law. And he met Lustiger. He says that when they spoke about different aspects of the law, Lustiger whipped out a mezuzah from his, from his drawer. <laughs> but uh, Vishegrad comments this saying, he whipped out the mezuzah, but it was in his drawer. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't uh, on the, at the door in the entrance. And um, I remember finding in my father's papers a letter in which Vishegrad asks my father to write to Lustiger to answer Vishegrad's questions about observing the law. And my father wrote to Lustiger. I found that letter as well. And Lustiger never answered. And I remember my father saying that Lustiger answered orally to my father, saying that he could not answer. <laughs> uh, and he says there are three reasons. One of the reasons was that 
as a child, he was not observant. And he said, what would it mean if as a child in a Jewish family, I'm not observant and then becoming uh, a baptized Roman Catholic or priest and a bishop, I start being observant. I just can't make that fit. The second thing is that he felt that he already was a source of, in a certain way, scandal for many of his flock. And he didn't want to add scandal to scandal. And also, and this is probably a, a deeper question, um, he said he didn't really completely understand what it meant for a Jewish disciple of Jesus to follow the law. And he never answered. He, op he let this question open. He would say, there are different ways of being a Jew. So uh, that's my only answer. There are different ways of being a Jew. But to your second part of your question, it's pretty simple. Were there tensions? No. He always was very adamant about the fact that he did not feel any tensions, that it was perfectly flowing. The only tensions he had were with some Christians and with some Jews. Probably the most observant thing he did was that he, he did recite Kaddish after his father's death. Okay, thank you. One more question. For, for the cases in which there is a lot of personal and emotional anguish for Jewish believers in Jesus, what might Cardinal Lustige have to say about the meaningfulness of Jewish identity and why it's worth it when it may come with a great cost and a lot of sorrow and difficulty? Well, Lustiger did say that Jesus, for him, was a sign of contradiction. He, he would use Paul's expression, a sign of, you know, a scandal, um, uh, so a, 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 a paradox for the Greeks and a scandal for the Jews, a sign of contradiction. And he, he used, it, it was interesting because he would, it, it, I think he would have loved this question, Amanda, uh, and he, but he, his first answer would be, I had no choice. It wasn't my choice. I was born a Jew. And when you're born a Jew, you're still a Jew. <laughs> you, and it's God's choice. And I encountered Christ. I encountered Jesus. I encountered the Messiah. And that wasn't my choice. And he wrote a book called God's Choice. And he would say, this was God's choice. At the same time, I think that it, it's one of the slides that I skipped um, he considered that he had a real vocation as a Jew inside the Roman Catholic Church in the sense that he would say the vocation of the people of Israel is to be a light to the nations. And uh, this would mean, and, and I, as a Jew inside of the church, I am um, uh, accomplishing the vocation of Israel, which is to bring the light to the nations. Uh, it, it, at least for two aspects. One is, um, he would often say that one of the risks of the church is paganism. I don't know exactly what he meant, if it was idolatry, if it was a question of uh, ethical questions, but he would say one of the risks of the church is paganism, and the church needs Jews inside of her and outside of her to remind her of the true God of Israel. And of course, the fact that he was a living reminder, he would say, I am a, a living reminder of the history of the church and of the fact that the church, uh, that, that Jesus the Messiah is Jewish and a full understanding of Jesus as Messiah can only come through Jews. And that's why he considered himself to be like, as, as I said, a light embedded in the nations or a light embedded in the church. Well, thank you so much for that, Father Etienne. Uh, a lot to think about. And um, for those of you who are interested in delving into this topic further, I'm sure in our follow-up emails, we'll include some resources, some book works by Cardinal Lucidige, some places to go look if you want more information or you want to delve into his life deeper. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Matthew Friedman uh, to share his faith journey story with us. So, with us. so please join me in welcoming him. Hey folks, um, it's good to be here. It's, um, it's interesting to be able to give my testimony in a context where, where it's primarily other Jewish followers of Yeshua. So my name is Matt Friedman. Um, I was born in the Holy City, which of course means Brooklyn, New York. Um, raised in New Jersey in a community of 
most, mostly in a community of New York refugees. Um, my family background is uh, my father, my father uh, is, uh, was Ashkenazi. He passed last year. Uh, he was Ashkenazi. Uh, my grandparents' parents mostly came from Poland, from Łódź. Uh, my mother's family, on the other hand, were, we used to say we were Sephardi on that side, but Sephardi only in the sense of not Ashkenazi. Um, so really uh, that side of the family was uh, what they call Romaniot, which basically means the Greek speaking uh, Jewish population of Northwest Greece. So uh, my maternal grandparents uh, came from Yanana uh, in Northwest Greece. And in fact, my uh, great grandfather was one of those uh, involved in starting Kehila Kedosha Yanana on Broom Street in Lower Manhattan, which is a, a Romaniot synagogue in Lower Manhattan, still there. Um, and I was named for my maternal grandfather. My gr maternal grandfather was, uh, his legal name was Matthias, but uh, but his real name was Matathia, which is which is Judeo Greek for for uh, Matthew. So my family was fairly secular growing up. Um, I uh, you, we went to, we we were were members of a conservative uh, synagogue in New Jersey. Um, I we we went for uh, high holy day services. I sometimes went to for Shabbat services, especially once I started Cheder Hebrew School. Uh, preparing for my bar mitzvah, getting basic, you know, Hebrew school education, such as one gets in the United States. Um, we celebrated Pesach with, uh, usually at my maternal grandparents' house. Uh, so we had, we had Jewish Greek food, which means we had better food for Pesach in a festival than a lot of our other, my other friends. Um, and, and, but we're fairly, fairly secular. Um, but in the run-up to my bar mitzvah, I began to become much more observant. And, uh, and in fact, you know, at the, at the bar mitzvah itself, they, the, w w the synagogue president always invites the, the, the bar mitzvah boy to, to go to, to be at the service the next day, uh, because now you can be part of the minion and nobody ever shows up. I showed up with my dad. I dragged my dad there um, and they were shocked to see me. But it was, it was something because this was part of my search for God. I was very hungry for God. I was very hungry to know spiritual reality. I was very hungry to know who God was. I thought God was kind of the big CEO of the universe, maybe didn't have time for me, so to speak. So I went, as I got older, I started to search in some pretty dark places. Um, even when I was a fairly young boy, I started to get very involved uh, in some occult things, and I don't want to go into the details of that, but some of that got pretty dark. Um, I started to get into kind of new age type of religion, um, got into, as, as I got into my teenage years, I got into drugs and drinking. Um, when I was 17 years old, I went to go, I went out to go drinking with a friend of mine, and uh, drinking, legal drinking age at that time was 19, um, but I bluffed my way past the poor girl at the counter at the liquor store. And uh, my friend and I got caught by the police who were trying to find out where all the teenagers were getting their beer. And um, so I, uh, they, they didn't arrest us. They just let us go because we were both underage. And um, so that night I went to, I went to the uh, youth center and people, what, a couple of guys who had been sharing their faith with me and I had, uh, had um, were there as well. Um, I had been offering the mostly intellectual arguments um, and a, a pretty hard, a pretty hard response. But, but they had, uh, but, but then I would go home, and I would, I would say, God, if this is true, you show me. And if it's not true, you show me. And uh, and so that night, I, I uh, this guy had a, he had a terrible, awful kind of tract designed for maybe an unconverted Southern Baptist or something. And, and, but I read it and I knew it was true. And there was this sense of like an, like an awning, like a, a hanging full of water um, hanging over my head. And that if I, would just, if I would just pierce it, I would just get drenched. And so I did, I, I, I prayed and I said, I believe in you, Yeshua. And it was like the awning cracked and I was drenched. And it was like being in a field working in a field, your legs are caked with mud and, I, and, and you come back in and you go to a well and you're washing your legs 
and suddenly you feel like you could jump high in the air. Well, spiritually, I felt that. It was almost like a physical thing. Well, well, um, there was some tension, as you might imagine, at home, as many of you probably have also had the privilege of experiencing. Um, there was uh, some, but, but uh, they began to see changes in my life. They were happy about that. Um, they saw God deliver me from drugs and alcohol. They're happy about that. About a year later, um, shortly after I graduated from high school, um, uh, the Lord began to speak to me about vocational ministry, that he was calling me to, to share about him with others full time. And this is not what I was expecting. I'm not even sure I really wanted it at the time, but it was, it was, it was clear that this was a calling for me. Um, a couple of years later, I, I got on a Greyhound bus in New York City, went 72 hours across the United States to, uh, to Oregon. I discovered my hair was about, was, was about a foot longer than it is now. There's not much left now, but um, I discovered there were people in the United States and some parts that didn't really appreciate guys who looked like that. Um, but uh, I had, uh, it was part of my vocational journey. I, I was trained for mission and for ministry in, through uh, an organization in Oregon, went to uh, Pasadena, and uh, worked in the Latin American community there, kind of uh, honed my Spanish skills. And somewhere in the midst of this, God began to speak to me about people who are very similar to us in a lot of ways, but, uh, but, also, but with whom we're, in, we're often in conflict, and that's our cousins, our Muslim friends. And so I began to have a sense that I had a calling to a vocation among Muslim people. Um, so 1990, I got on a plane and I took off for South Asia, um, where I spent the next 18 years of my life working among Muslim people. Um, I, found, I found Muslim people, um, and some, some of us would be aware of this and many might not, I found that Muslim people often face many of the same issues we face, same, some of the same barriers in considering even the gospel of Jesus. I um, prejudice against the gospel just within, within their own community, historic persecution sometimes. In this case, it was more colonialism, but, but also, also echoes from the crusades and things like that. And theological issues such as the incarnation of the word in Yeshua and the, the Trinity, the, the idea that, God, that God's spirit and God's word are within God's essence. We're, we're, difficult for my Muslim friends, just as they were difficult for me coming to faith when I, before I came really to know him. But as I came to know him, as I began to understand these things, as I began to see that this longing that I'd earlier had for union with him was actually fulfilled in Yeshua, um, I began to realize that as I interacted with some of my Muslim friends in South Asia and did a lot of reading of their community and their traditions, I began to see, especially among what are called the Sufi people, in South Asia, uh, Muslim mystics, they often had a similar yearning for union with God. It was also around this time that I began to connect with some of the writings of the early church, um, the writings of Athanasios, especially on the incarnation of the word of God, the, um, the writings of the Macarian homilies that also are very focused on union with God and the be being filled with God's spirit. And I began to realize there was a treasure here in the early church that directly speaks to the yearning that our Muslim friends have. I began to do research on this and I ended up going back to school, eventually completing my PhD at Asbury Seminary in intercultural studies. But I, I, my focus was on, was on what does this mean? I began, as I began to look at the at, 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 uh, Bible passages that connected and and again, early Christian writings that connected with union with God, I began to realize that this was, this was, um, there are a lot of these things that were addressing things in the, in the early Jewish community as well. It was, um, it was stunning to be able to see this. I began to research, part of my research involved early Jewish mysticism too, of the, the, Mer the Merkava, and uh, I think we're at time, and, uh, but Anyway, to wrap it up, um, uh, this early mysticism, I realized that there was a response to that in the scriptures 
centered on who Yeshua was and uh, wrote about it and everything. Anyway, thank you. This was a lot of fun. Okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite um, Father Etienne to and uh, you to keep your camera on um, as we transition to our question and answer segment. Um, our first question comes from Father David Neuhaus, who wants a clarifying comment from you, Father Etienne, about something you said about Cardinal Lucy J. And um, actually, I'd love to hear your input on this, Dr. Friedman, about um, this question, given some of the things you commented on. Um, but did Cardinal Lucy J. believe that in becoming Christian, he had found the meaning of Judaism in general, or that he found the medium, uh, the meaning of Judaism for himself personally? It's a very precise question because it's and it really corresponds to Luc Stiget in the sense that he would explicitly say, for me, encountering Jesus made me understand Judaism, uh, uh, the, in a, made me really find the, the understanding of Judaism uh, in comparison to what I knew about Judaism. And it's true that it, this is something I've often noticed is that um, many Jewish believers in Jesus um, have a, a strong experience of God uh, through Christianity and often have not had this strong experience of God when they were Jewish through their upbringing. And so the, my first answer would be for Lustige, it was first of all a personal thing, but he would also say that theologically, it was the general meaning of Judaism. Uh, and at the same time, he would insist that he never asked Jews to become Christians because once again, this was God's choice. <laughs> so it was a, a three level answer. Personally, definitely. Also generally, but that's God's question. That's God's problem. Oops, sorry. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I would have anything really to add to that, specifically, of course, concerning Cardinal Lustiger. Lustiger. That's, that's not really my topic, but, but, uh, but I think, I think part of the thing is there's Judaisms, right? Um, even in the, even in ancient times, there wasn't any one Judaism. I, of course, in terms of my own journey, I see that, I do see Yeshua as, as providing that meaning. Um, I see in, say, for example, in John 14, I see him him actually answering questions about, about uh, the Hechalot and the, the Mirkava um, about Jewish mysticism. Um, he's basically pointing back to himself as the answer to that question. Um, so I, uh, I would say that that's broader. That was certainly the case for me. So that was something that I came to much later. Thank you. Another question for Father Etienne. Uh, the question is, what would have been the impact of the three mentioned on the epitaph, so Aaron the High Priest, St. John the Apostle, and Holy Mary Full of Grace, in the spiritual life of Lustige? I'm sure you could give an entire retreat on this topic, and so if you would like to choose one of those or, or say something uh, brief, then, then take it away. I think it's important to say something about all three because the complimentary, but I'll be quick. Um, uh, he, he really insisted on keeping Aaron because of his roots, of course, but for him, he was the high priest. And that was his vocation as a priest and bishop. He, was, he had the impression that in the same way as Isaiah 66 too, says that um, uh, there will be priests among the, the Gentiles and so on. He, he was bringing uh, Aaronic priesthood to the church. Um, John, in his name, Jean, it was John the Baptist. And for him, John the Baptist was the, the, the one, the greatest among men, as Jesus said, because he was in the old covenant and he was opening to the new covenant. So he was the one from the old covenant, covenant preparing for the Messiah. And for him, Mary, Mary was the church. Uh, the church as a mother. And so she, Mary was a daughter of Zion. She was Jewish but she opened her arms to, to everyone and she was the one who brought in everyone. Excellent, thanks. Over to Jason. Um, this qu next question is for uh, Matthew. Um, coming from the vantage point of missions, how do you think missions might uh, factor into um, 
the mission and identity of uh, Yaakov and Yeshua, and what aspects of mission do you think would help these kind of conversations um, yeah. move forward? Yeah, I think, I think uh, first and foremost, I think we need to be able to understand that mission is, is primarily, primarily God's, God's work. Um, you know, the whole, in, in academic circles, what they call the Missio Dei, um, that, that uh, mission begins with God and the God sending of himself. And he invites us to participation with him in his mission. And so I think what we are doing here, as I understand it, in Yahab Be'eshua, um, is, is we, are, we are joining in that participation with one another of, of looking at what is, what, does, what is our identity as Jewish people in, in the body of Messiah's people look like, in the community of Messiah's people look like, um, to our own respective ecclesial communities, but even to people outside. Um, for me, it's terribly important that, that, that my own family members, that my own community, I mean, it's one of the ironies of my own situation is um, I believe in Yeshua, but I'm probably the most firm member of my family, even right now. Um, and so it's, for, they respect that. They respect that. So, and that, and that has a missional effect, I think, um, both in terms of being able to have fruitful conversations and to be, to be upfront, I think I, I want Jewish people as well as non-Jewish people to be drawn into relationship with, with the Messiah as well. And I think that that also connects with, with the conversations that we have in, in Yechad B'Yeshua. Um, another question for um, Father Etienne. Um, Scott Moore notes that Michael Vishagrad believed that being Jewish requires um, identification with the Jewish community. So he's wondering, did Cardinal Lusage uh, have a response to this idea? Um, and how would one go about kind of exploring uh, this idea? Actually, and um, Scott would like, love to hear uh, Matthew's comments on this as well. This is a, a difficult, it's a very good and difficult question because as I said, Lustiger Le, admitted that he didn't really know what it meant to relate to the law, for example, and mm -hmm. that he was still thinking about that. Um, but for what was sure is that he felt he was Jewish in his flesh and in the history of his family. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he, he really pushed uh, the Catholic Church towards repentance and he would go himself to commemorations of the Shoah. And uh, the chief rabbi of France writes once that he was at one of these commemorations and when they were speaking about Auschwitz where um, Lucie's mother had been killed, uh, he, he just glanced towards Lucie and he saw the Archbishop of Paris crying. And he said, I knew that he was thinking about his mother. And so um, the, he, he had this really sort of a f uh, flesh and blood and historic relation to, to the Jewish people. Uh, I, I would say maybe also another point uh, is that um, he, he really worked for the church to recognize uh, what the what the, the history of the Jewish people. Uh, for example, this story of the Carmel of Auschwitz where there, there, there was um, a group of nuns who had established a monastery in the 80s in Auschwitz. Mm. Lustiger was one of the, probably the most instrumental person in getting John Paul II to understand that that was a real problem. <laughs> and, and that the memory, in a certain way, of giving the church a memory of the Shoah. So he would say, I'm a bridge in this case. But okay, I, I, he, he, he was, it was a difficult question for him. He, he didn't really know. Yeah. Um, the other thing I would add to that, um, just for myself, I know, and I'll give you a very personal answer. Um, my, my youngest brother had also um, declared himself as a Christian a couple of years ago, uh, or many years ago, but he died a couple of years ago. And at his funeral, um, a, a mutual friend uh, kind of gave a, gave, preached at the gravesite, gave a message a uh, very Christian message, and and you could feel the tension in the crowd around my uh, around uh, which my brother might have appreciated, <laughs> um, but uh, but then uh, after he had, my friend had finished, I I thanked him, and then I said, okay, if, uh, if everyone could turn in the direction of Yudushalayim, and and I recited Kaddish, 
and you could feel that you could feel that things cool down immediately. And uh, I recited it in in Aramaic and in English, and um, and I had several relatives come and thank me, um, both for reciting Kaddish, which, of course, right, but but also, but also for for translating it because they, one cousin said he'd never heard it translated before, which I found odd, but okay. But it was it was still serving as a bridge in that sense. Thanks. All right, uh, I'm gonna weave a couple of questions we've received together on uh, these topics. Mm -hmm. Father Etienne, uh, these are for you. The questions are, uh, Catholic churches have statues of saints and uh, Catholics pray to Mary. How would Lustige, as a Jewish Catholic, reconcile the commandment against images and, and also going uh, to Mary uh, in prayer and uh, a relate, another question is, does contemplative prayer have a place for Jewish believers in Jesus? And uh, what does that look like? So again, a uh, oh. wide topic. <laughs> uh, thanks for touching on that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if the first question is more about the statues or about the saints themselves, <laughs> because it's not exactly the same question. Uh, it's true that um, I'm guessing here what Lucie would say, but I think he would say two things about the statues. One would be to say that the incarnation of the Son of God probably made it possible for Christians, for a believer in Jesus, to represent God, so the, um, or at least to represent Jesus. Sorry, uh, and and but okay, statues of saints are another thing. What, what's what's sure is that he. He interprets in the, the book, The Promise, um, the, the, this commandment as not putting anything in the stead of God. The, the, his real problem is not statues in themselves, but not putting anything in the stead of God. And he would say, um, for example, when you touch a, a mezuzah or when you touch the Torah scroll, when it passes by, you're not represent saying that this is at the place of God it's just a support in your your relation to God and so that a statue would play exactly the same role uh, so it would be a kind of a yeah um, going to the meaning of the commandment um, and but it, because it's true that uh, I, I saw the question <laughs> uh, cri cri Christians Catholics that do not um, uh, pray statues they pray God and they ask the saints for intercession to, to be clear in the, the categories. As far as contemplative life is concerned, I, I won't really know. Um, what is true is that um, the Carmelite order in the Catholic Church is, um, resonates very much and thinks that its roots are in the, the story of pro the prof prophet Elijah uh, on, Mount, on Mount Carmel, living this very powerful experience of God inside of the, the cave um, and saying, this has its roots also in, in Jewish tradition, uh, be, being alone in relation to God. So this is where we could say there are so many, there's so much diversity in, in what Jewish tradition is. Mm -hmm. um, Kabbalah is also, it, it, it's not contemplative, but it it opens up to something that uh, is very different than many other types of, of Judaism. So we have this very wide variety, um, and uh, that's what we can. That's where we can find the, the different the roots of the different aspects of um, of the, the Catholic way of of praying God through Yeshua. Mm. Yeah, um, if I might make a remark about contemplative prayer briefly, um, I think. I mean, my research is on mysticism, right? But um, I think there's a, a, I know in evangelical circles, uh, especially in North America, that's very, that's become very controversial in some circles. Um, I don't think it necessarily needs to be controversial. I think it's, it depends on what you're doing and what you mean by that. I think if we're, as we meditate on, on the scriptures and on the person of Yeshua and the incarnation, um, the idea of our being in union with God and in relationship, real relationship with him, um, to just be able to sit at his feet even, I think it's tremendously important for us to be honest with you. 
Um, I think I think when people start to try and glom it together with certain forms of, say, Buddhist meditation, sometimes that is is less than helpful, especially when it when it delves into a, a more pantheistic view of God. But it's like a Indian mystic, Christian Indian mystic, Sadhu Sundar Singh. Um, described, he said, it's not like a drop in the ocean. It's like more like a sponge in the water. The sponge is filled with the water's presence, but the, but the sponge remains a sponge. And even though the sponge itself is, is transformed, changed, it's a different size. It's a different nature, really. But it's still a sponge. We don't become God as that in that sense. But the reality of, of being united with him means we are transformed. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you to both of you for, for those excellent answers. And as always, continue to submit your questions. We'll send them up. We'll, we'll respond to them in follow-up emails and can engage the panelists further through uh, emails to all of you. Uh, the Yachad Bey Yeshua website is up and running. It's got information on the history, links to past webinars, the very uh, uh, the, the blog, additional resources for study, uh, you can access that at yahadbeyeshua.org. Uh, there's a dash in between there, and you can access it from your email blasts too. Check it out, subscribe, receive updates. And if you appreciate these events and would like to support the work, please go and make a contribution on the new website as well. We're very grateful for your contributions. We have many attendees, and if everyone chipped in, it'd make a big difference. Our next Yahad Yeshua webinar will be on Wednesday, February 24th in the same time slot, and the topic will be Joseph Rabinowitz, The Herzl of Jewish Christianity and Messianic Judaism. Uh, I won't say that 10 times fast, <laughs> but I hope to see you there. Uh, Rabinowitz was the first Jew since the early centuries of the Common Era to call for the establishment of distinct communities of Jewish disciples of Jesus, communities that would circumcise their sons and honor the Sabbath and Jewish holidays. He, his views gained worldwide attention and launched a debate that's continued to this day. In this webinar, Richard Harvey, a leading Messianic Jewish historian and theologian, will speak about Rabinowitz and his significance for us in the 21st century. Uh, and in that session, I'll be sharing a brief testimony about my life and faith as a Jewish Catholic. Now, I am pleased to hand it over to Rabbi Dr. Mark Kinzer for some concluding comments. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Father Etienne and Matt. Uh, terrific presentations. Uh, and I have a couple of um, updates uh, on Yachad Bi Yeshua. Uh, at uh, some point in the month of February, we plan to uh, begin receiving applications for membership uh, through our website. Uh, and uh, so that any Jewish disciples of Yeshua who are interested in Yachad Bi Yeshua, uh, keep your eyes uh, open in February. Um, if you're on our mailing list, when we're ready to receive uh, such applications, we will uh, send uh, an, an email to everybody on our mailing list. So you can also, if you're not already um, on the list, uh, you can uh, sign up at our website. Uh, we will also have a, a status of friends of Yachad Yeshua for those who are not Jewish, but who are very supportive of uh, the mission, the call, the identity of Yachad B. Yeshua, but we'll be waiting a couple more months before we receive applications to be friends of Yachad B. Yeshua. Uh, now, uh, in, re in relation to uh, our future webinars, uh, after the February webinar on uh, Rabinowitz, we are uh, going to be shifting from a, uh, a, a monthly rhythm of our public webinars to an every other month uh, rhythm so that uh, we will have our web our public webinar in February, but then the, the next webinar after that um, will be in April. And then the one following that um, will be in June. Uh, and uh, with that, I'm just going to uh, offer a concluding prayer, uh, a brucha. Brucha Tadanoi Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the universe, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, Father of Messiah, Yeshua, you who've raised up courageous witnesses such as Cardinal Lustiger, 
who bore testimony to your unfailing love for both Israel and the church in Mashiach. Grant us all the fortitude to follow his example and bear the same testimony in our place, in our time, in our particular circumstances. We ask this through Yeshua the Messiah, in the one spirit to the glory of your holy name.